Welcome to uh, using persuasion techniques to drive higher conversions. This is based on uh, my book. <clears throat> this is based out of chapter five in the book about persuasion. But interestingly enough, oh, Jose, good to see you too also, buddy. Um, the, uh, there's more than just the book in here. Uh, it's not more than just my book. This is based on literally years and years of, of, of sales and marketing experience. And I think I've said this to people before who've been to some of my other webinars. Um, if you haven't read um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, and I know, I know it's an older book. I get it, guys. But if you haven't read it, I, I'm telling you, there are just such gems in that book um, that it's worth reading. And, and if you have read it, um, you may or may not remember that one of the things he recommended in that book was that you reread that book. I think it's every six months or at least once a year, because we all develop bad habits and, and it's a refresher to remind us to put the other person first. And so persuasion, the most persuasive thing that you can do is truly be interested in the other person. And so before I get into the actual presentation, I want to share a story with you about the most persuasive person I had ever met. Um, this was someone I worked for, and this is back in the days when I was doing more technical work. Uh, I was a developer, and my boss and I had to fly to um, England to meet with the development staff over in England. And I remember working with this man and just thinking about how smart he was and all of this stuff. And we're in this meeting and the development team in England wasn't doing what he wanted them to do. So how did he persuade them to do what he wanted? And the way he did it is he started asking questions. And he said to them things like, well, that's really interesting. He would come in, uh, I wouldn't have thought of that, doing it that way. So if we did it that way, how would we accommodate X? And they'd think for a minute and then they would talk about the next thing, okay? And then the, the, they, they'd ask another question and he would ask, well, if we did that and that's good, how would we get to Y? And I watched him go from start of where these people were to 180 degrees to where he wanted them to be in the first place. And he did this by asking questions. And what was interesting about that was two things. One is I watched this master at work, getting people to come to what he wanted them to do by having it be their idea. I can't even begin to tell you how mind boggling that was because of item number two. I realized he'd been doing that to me for six months. I was so, <laughs> I was so mortified that I was persuaded to, to change all my positions on things by the way he was asking questions. But really the, the takeaway on all of this is, is, is if you focus on the other person, and this has been a, a theme of mine throughout my book, as well as you know all of these webinars, well, you can be much more persuasive. Um, and somebody asked, what was the title of the book? The title of the book was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It, it is a book that I've read, I can't tell you how many years ago, and it really was um, uh, an amazing book. I do read it once a year because it reminds me to put the other person first. All right. So with that said, let's get into uh, persuasion to drive conversions. So what is persuasion marketing? This is what we're going to talk about, the art of persuasion, uh, persuasion based on your audience, some examples to avoid, and of course, uh, 10 principles to apply in marketing. Now, if you paid attention to the email we sent out, we sent out that we're going to teach you seven. So you got a bonus three because once I get started, uh, well, I don't stop. So forgive me on that. So if you want to leave after the seventh, I understand. All right. No, anyway. So with that said, um, let's uh, talk about what exactly is persuasion marketing. Well, persuasion, I, you know, I really want to say that it, it's, it's a way of thinking. And it, it's really an art form where you, you really are helping people to come to conclusions based on things that they are taking in 
on, on your website. And, and these same skills that we're talking on, on a website are also the same skills that you have when you're you're dealing with people. So if, if you think about it, I go back to the meeting that I talked about where this boss of mine was getting everybody on the same page as him. These are the same techniques that you could use in meetings. These are the same techniques that you could use if you're a parent and you're dealing with children, or if you've got an older parent who are acting like children and you need to persuade them to do whatever. You know, these are really great skills to have. So persuasion is basically thinking about how other people are are consuming the information you're giving them in such a way that they are and here's the key persuading themselves to take action okay so it's multi-level all right you know you can't just do gimmicky things. You've seen way too many gimmicky things on the internet uh, and people are, are way too smart for that. I'll give you an example about uh, a gimmicky thing uh, that I've seen. Uh, and, and there's a good version of this and a bad version of this, right? Have you all been to a website and hopefully none of you are using this gimmicky thing that I'm about to say, um, but you're on a website and a little pop-up pops up and it says, John V from Oklahoma just bought this. And then it goes away. And then Joanne W from Albuquerque just bought it. Really? Seriously? Do, do we really think things like that work? Well, unfortunately, they do a little bit. But, but at some level, you're turning off people with, with hokey stuff. Now, we're going to show you other ways to persuade people that aren't as hokey. All right. So with that all said, let's move on to... The art of persuasion. So what's the perfect balance between demanding and encouraging? Well, here it is. All right. Persuasion is vital, you know, but you've got to keep your, your, your customers space safe. People want to feel safe and secure. And so here's the thing. Don't demand anything. All right. Encourage people to take action. Do not do what we call the bottom of the funnel opera school of marketing me, 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 me. It's all about me. I don't care about you. Don't be that person online. Persuade people by providing value. All right. So what is the art of persuasion? It's subtle. You're not hounding people with buy now, buy now. Or, and we've talked about this in the past, those, those entry pops where it's like they haven't even been on your website for 30 seconds. And guess what? You're in their face yelling at them. All right. Be clear. What do you want them to do? You know, identify, you'll notice their need and focus on that. All right. And then make sure that your visitor understands your value proposition. And there's no room for doubt. If you're clear about what they need and how you're going to solve that problem, that is a form of persuasion. And don't be intrusive. Do not violate, you know, their personal space. Do not be creepy. Let people feel like they're in control. Now, I've used this um, this uh, analogy or this description before. When you walk into a large department store and you see signs everywhere where the sign says, you know, women's department here, auto parts over there, electronics over here, whatever it is you're looking at, you're in control. You walk in, nobody's hounding you, and you're looking, oh, I want to go buy a laptop, so I'm going to go to the electronics department or the computer department or whatever it is. I feel like I'm in control. And when I get to the computer department, and let's say we're at Best Buy, you know, they, they don't hound you. They ask, can I help you? And if the answer is no, that's fine. They don't, they don't abuse you. It's not like you're on a used car lot where, you know, and we've all done this. I mean, and you don't have to raise your hands here, but, but think about it this way. You've all gone to a car dealership, or I shouldn't say you all have. You probably have gone to a car dealership, you know, and you were just looking. You weren't ready to buy. You were just looking. Maybe you were killing a Saturday afternoon. Maybe you were thinking about what would my next car be, you know, six months or a year down the road. And what happens? The salesperson's all over you with, you know, expecting, when are you, when are you looking to purchase? Now, I understand what they're trying to do and why they're doing it, but how did that make you feel? It made you feel like you wanted to pick up a rock and bang them in the head with it. So 
being persuasive is being subtle, being clear, and not being intrusive on on what the uh, the problem is. Okay, so um, so we have to identify the type of persuasion needed. Okay, so let's think about this. All right, you know, if somebody it comes to your site and and you know, depends on what you're selling, right? You know, it could be a subscription to something. It could be, you know, um, uh, acne cream, all right? I mean, it could be anything. If I come to your site, all right, and I am a 20-year-old man with acne, and I, I'm just so unhappy, and I feel like, oh, my God, I look like a toe, all right? I mean, I, I uh, or whatever, however they feel, I'm really motivated already I don't need a lot of persuasion to take action. But if you're a parent and you know your child is suffering from acne, you know, you're 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 probably more like a warm lead. You want to solve the problem for them, but you don't have that same level of emotional commitment. You're not a hot lead, you are more of a a warm lead. And this is true whether we're doing lead generation or e-commerce sales or subscription sales. So depending upon where those people are and in the buying cycle or their process, that says what type of persuasion you need to give them so that people will take the next step. Okay. Now, cold leads. Somebody who is truly just wandering around. This is, I'll go back to the car dealership. I have no interest in, in ever buying a I don't know, a Corvette. All right. And so, uh, and if any of you own a Corvette, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not abusing Corvette owners. Right. So, so I go, you know, I'm just curious. I, I wanted to go sit in a Corvette. I'm not going to spend a hundred thousand or whatever it is for the Corvette, you know? Uh, and, and so, but I go there and I'm a cold lead and I have no intention of converting, but interestingly enough, you know, if, you are subtle and you talk about the benefits of it or whatever benefits of Corvette are, you might get them to actually move from a cold lead to potentially a warm lead. That's very top of the funnel marketing. The same thing happens whether they walk into a car dealership or they're on your website. If you know what kind of person they are, top of the funnel versus bottom of the funnel, you're going to provide different levels of of persuasion or different types of persuasion to get someone to take action. All right, so the greatest opportunity now, and this is really counterintuitive, and so stick with me. We talked about hot leads. Hot leads, you know, and, and somebody told me this, that if 20% of the visitors that come to your website, and let's just do the math here, okay? If 20% of the visitors that come to your website are are not leads, but they are prospects. And let me define the difference between a lead and a prospect for a second. A lead is somebody that you want to sell. You know, it's, it's they come to your website, or even if you were doing outreach, it's somebody you think they should buy my product or service. That's a lead, all right? Doesn't necessarily mean they're a prospect. A prospect is basically a lead who agrees with you. A prospect is someone who says, you know what? I really could use this. You know, this probably could solve my problem. And there's a lot more definitions between a marketing qualified lead and a sales qualified lead. But just for the sake of argument right now, let's talk about, you know, the difference between a lead and a prospect. And so a lead is somebody you think should buy your product or service. A prospect is somebody who agrees with you. Now, here's what's interesting. Hot leads, and there have been studies on this, hot leads out of that 20%, only 20% of them are hot leads. That's the, the the bottom of the bottom of the funnel. These are the people who are ready to buy. So that's basically 4% of the people that come to your website potentially are these hot leads. Well, what about the other 16%? Those are the warm leads. And so you have more opportunity on the warm leads. Why? One, the hot leads, they're probably going to buy no matter what you do, unless your website looks like who did it and ran, or you're doing, or it's broken, or you're doing something just, just nuts. They're probably going to subscribe, buy, become a lead, or do whatever, right? So the greatest opportunity for persuasion are the warm leads. These are the people who really are looking to potentially buy a car, get acne cream, do whatever it is that they're going to do. And so they're warm. They need more persuasion than a hot lead, all right? 
And at the same time, if you spend too much time trying to persuade the cold leads, right, and we'll talk about them later on, you know, you're, 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 you're really barking up the wrong tree. So the greatest opportunity for persuasion are, are the warm leads. That is the 80% of the people that come to you, okay, is, uh, is, a, uh, is potentially the warm lead that you could get. Um, Lauren asked, uh, uh, you know, a prospect is a micro conversion of a lead. So, so let's just talk about micro conversions for a second. So a micro conversion is where you don't get the final action. Uh, uh, so for example, I, I, an e-commerce site, if I buy from you, that's a conversion. If I am on a lead generation site and I fill out the form or I call you, that's a conversion. And a subscription site, if I subscribe, that's a conversion. So what is a micro conversion? A micro conversion is somebody who takes a step in the right direction. So it, let's say we are on a, uh, a category page on an e-commerce site and you get them to put a couple of your products maybe into the compare list. That's a micro conversion. They haven't bought yet, but they've taken another step further in the process. In a lead generation site, it might be that they have you know, uh, read a piece of content, downloaded something. They've taken a step in that process that gets them a little bit further along. So, so if they're taking that kind of step here, um, and and they are moving from just being a lead to to potentially being, you know, you know, a prospect. All right, because. They're interested. They've indicated in some way, shape, or form they're in. They're interested. So Joanna asked. By the way, hopefully you don't mind. In the, and this is just my style, guys. I answer. I try to answer questions when they come up. Sometimes I, I don't get to them all, but I, I I don't want you to wait to the end. And oh, Mar Marty never answered my question. So. Um, uh, anyway, so the question was, can you clarify the breakdown of those types of users and percentages from those who visit your website uh, through the hot lead? So again, these are these are across all sorts of industries. So they're you know they depend they're they're more dependent on on industry. But if you look generically at a website, what it happens is eighty percent of the people that you come to your website are you know are people that you might want to sell you know, because you want to sell everyone, you want them to be a lead, you want them to be whatever, but they're really, they're, they're really not a prospect for you. 20% of those people, okay, are potentially prospects, all right? And so what, so what we're talking about, the cold leads, you know, the people that are cold in using the, the, term, the, the, the terms that are in this presentation, that's the 80% where you can bang your head against the wall and you may get them. The Warm leads and hot leads are in the other 20%. The hot leads are 20% of that 20%, or basically 4% of the people that come to a site are hot. 16% of them are warm, and then the other 80% are the cold. So hopefully that answers the question, all right? And, and Jose asked earlier on, does that stuff work, which I believe um, you were talking about, you know, did they take the offer? It does work, but but it really depends upon the type of website you've got and the and the people that are coming to your website. If you're selling to people who are sophisticated, then no, Jose, that stuff does not work. Okay, if you're if you're on a uh, a page that's one of those get rich quick long form sales letters. Yeah, unfortunately, that stuff does work for those, but that's a very unsophisticated audience. All right. All right. Moving on. Uh, so where do we get it wrong? All right. And so here's the thing. People tend to try to persuade people. This is the buy now on sale. You know, they're just assuming that everybody needs to be pushed. And that's really a bad example. Everyone needs to be pushed to buy their product. And you really don't wanna push people to buy your product. What you wanna do is give them enough information and to be persuasive, subtle, like we talked about. So when they look at it, they think it's their idea, all right? I go back again to that, that story I told in the beginning. When people think it's their idea, they are more likely to do something than if you know they know it's your idea. Think about, Wherever you work, think about it this way. 
somebody comes with, to you with a problem. And if you say to them, well, that's interesting. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? What you're doing is you're asking questions, but you're not asking questions uh, that are trying to elicit them to think. You're asking questions where you're basically presenting ideas to them and they might pick one of those ideas. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Right. And, and so they go away. It's their idea and they, they'll, they'll implement it, but they'll do it half heartedly because it really wasn't their idea. On the other hand, when they, they, someone comes to you with a problem, and that's what is happening on your website. People are coming to you to solve a problem. If they come to you to, to ask a problem and you're basically saying, you know, well, what have you done to, to, to overcome that problem? How, you know, what have you done to move this from here to there? You know, what are the different things you've tried? And you get them to start talking about, and this works in meetings. We, I've done this for years. When you get people to talk about solutions, and even if you already know what the solution should be, but you get them to talk about the solution and it's their idea, oh my God, it suddenly is a brilliant idea. Um, so one of the people who uh, is on my team who is, um, who is moderating this is Stacy. Stacy and I have worked together for years, you know, and she's probably already rolling her eyes when I say this next thing. But Stacy has pointed out to me that the team members a lot of times will, will be in a meeting and they'll point out an idea and I'll hear it and I, I won't act on the idea. A week will go by, a month will go by. She's probably laughing at this point, you know, maybe a couple months and I'll go, hey, I got an idea and I will articulate the same idea that they had, but now it's my idea. And I, of course, think it's a brilliant idea that I came up with. I have taken credit not on purpose, you know, for Stacy's ideas and Alexander's ideas and all these things, because I hear it, but then I start to think about it more and it comes out as my idea. And I could actually say it exactly the same way. But what sounded like an idea when they presented it to me, it's like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. But when it's my idea, all of a sudden, it's a brilliant freaking idea, right? So people need to come to conclusions on their own. And so you can't push people to make these types of decisions. Hopefully that makes a ton of sense to everybody. All right, so what's an example? And this is what we talked about. Insanely insistent CTAs, buy this, buy this, sale, on sale, you know, all of this stuff where you're basically screaming at people, you know, and you really don't wanna scream at people. You want them to be able to decide on their own. All right. Um, and then uh, some of these others, uh, I, we've all said, the number one this, really? The best this, according to who, okay? Seriously, now if you're gonna say best, prove it. According to JD Power and Associates, the number one this, according to Inc. Magazine, whatever it is, don't use baseless uh, adjectives, all right? And, and then, you know, long text, uh, where, where you're trying to explain things in painful detail. You know, that's like an army of words marching on the page looking for meaning. Nobody reads it. You need to be short and sweet to the point. So with all of that as the setup, now we're going to talk about the, uh, the principles of persuasion. Now, in fairness, some of these I've borrowed from, from other people. You'll, you'll, you might recognize a couple of these from uh, 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 Cialdini, all right, who I reference in the book, all right, but some of these others are the things that we have learned over the years from doing A-B testing. So the first one actually is one of uh, Cialdini's six principles, all right, and this is the, although he calls it uh, the um, uh, the principles uh, are of, um, uh, it's not persuasion, of, um, of influence. There you go, principles influence. So we're calling these the principles of persuasion. And the first one is reciprocity, all right? And so this is one where you, and I've said this many times, you give before you get, all right? And our human behavior is kind of on the tendency to reciprocate, you know, goodwill. If you give something to somebody, they feel the need to give something in return, all right? And when you give this in, in marketing, all right, visitors are wired to respond in a positive way, all right? So how do you use it? Well, you give free, useful content. You provide a webinar. I don't know, kind of like this, right, guys? All right, a video tutorial, a product sample, something that boosts that connection with a visitor. 
You share your time. We do that too. You, if the best thing you can give somebody is your time, if possible. All right. If it's relevant to your business, then it's great to give out free consultations or tutorials, you know, and give a, a, a personalized thanks. Return customers are great. I got to tell you, I just, I'm going to go off tangent here for a second. Um, I did an unboxing video, of, I got to say it was about a year ago. And in the box was a handwritten note. I mean, it was really a handwritten note. You know, it wasn't a pre-printed note because what was in there was personalized to me with, with some details that you couldn't automate. And, and look, if you're selling a widget and, and you sell a, a million of them a month, you're not gonna be sending out handwritten notes. But if you can do something where it's personalized, well, I can't even begin to tell you how touched I was to get a true handwritten note in, in this purchase. It really, really makes a difference, right? So some type of personalized thanks. Now there are ways to automate some personalized thanks, but but if you if it's sincere, because you don't want to fake sincerity, but if, if it's sincere, you're getting some real personalized thank you and someone's going to feel good about that. All right. So this is an example uh, of, um, of a website we helped design. Uh, and this is their page where they talk about understand 45 CFR part 75. Oh my God, no idea. But basically this is accounting for companies that get a grant from the US government. And so what kind of accounting do you need to do to do this? Now, here's the thing, they've got a video and so on, but let me actually pull up this page as a real example, okay? So this is the live example of the page. And, and so I can watch a video. He's got an explanation here on, on this, right? And I can download the white paper or I can open the white paper, right? So let me ask this question. And I, I bet you when I want to download the white paper or I want to open the white paper, what do you think they're going to ask for next? An e email address, a name, a kind of company? You know, take a guess. You know, they're going to ask for something, right? Well, guess what? And name and email, Dave says. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that makes complete and total sense, Dave. All right. But here's the thing. When I open this, all right, they actually give it to me. I, I, they don't ask for anything. So if I, if I go to download the, the white paper and just make it blow up a little bit bigger, there was no ask whatsoever. And so, Dave, you might say, that's counterintuitive. How are they generating leads here? They didn't ask for a name. They didn't ask for an email. They didn't do anything. Well, we teach people to do this all the time. And why would you give somebody this information for free? This invokes the principle of reciprocity. And you'll notice they've got a link to their website in here. You can download it. And they give real quality information. This is actually very, very, very well done. And so what happens when I'm reading through this and I'm learning about all this and they're showing examples and we get to the very end of this PDF here and guess what? They have actually earned the right to ask for something. Schedule a call or call now. So this is truly, truly invoking the principle of reciprocity. And we have the hardest time convincing people that this works. Here's what this does for you. If you are trying to get someone to, to become a lead for you and you put in, you know, download your name and email address and all of that good stuff, guess what? They're going to use an email address that they, they never check. It's their spam email address. You know, they're only going to go in it to verify it. And do you really want to be sending them and putting them into funnels because you're going to magically make one of these cold leads who really wasn't all that interested suddenly become one of your clients? Seriously? And do you really want to talk on the phone with somebody who is never, ever, ever going to buy from you or be a client? Do you really want to do that? And I'm going to tell you the answer is no. All right. Now, let's take the, the corresponding, the, the, the reverse of this. If I am on this man's site and I get this wonderful, informative PDF, also watches his, 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 his video, and I feel good about this person, what do you think the chances that if I call or if I schedule a call, that I'm actually a real prospect? I went from being, you know, 
just somebody who visited the site who may or may not be a real prospect to guess what? I'm somebody who's probably going to buy from you, right? I can't even begin to tell you how powerful this is to give away stuff. Now, they're scheduling a call and they're calling out. So to schedule a call or do something, guess what? You do wind up telling them about information. This is where uh, you, 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 you could ask for at the next step, your name and your email address. Because guess what? If you give something of value, they're probably going to give you a much better email address or a real phone number than they would have otherwise. And I'm telling you folks, this works. All right. I think I beat that one into the ground. Uh, the frequency of illusion. All right. So we've all seen this. Um, uh, so uh, let me give you an example. If you've ever, I, I'll, I'll even give you a weird example. So years ago, we bought a uh, Toyota Camry. Do you have any idea how many Camrys are on the road? I mean, there, there's, there's millions and millions of these things. They're all over the place, right? Uh, and Tim, yes, if you leave early, buddy, uh, you will you will get a recording. Um, uh, and uh, no worries. But sorry to see you go. We understand. So, all right. So, uh, so the frequency of losing. So, this Camry. The second we got it, we started to notice there were Camrys on the road everywhere. Doesn't matter what kind of car you got. It, it is amazing. Whatever you're thinking about buying or you, you've bought, you start to notice them everywhere. So, so did the Camry become a better car because I saw lots of them? Well, in my mind it did, right? Because guess what? I'm seeing them over and over and over again. So you know what? This must be good. It's, it's, it's magical thinking almost. When you see something, you start to notice it even more and it makes more sense to you, okay? So how do you use the frequency of illusion? Well, um, one of the easiest way is, is to make sure that they see you everywhere. So obviously retargeting is absolutely you know, amazing. So here's an example. And this, this is probably gonna tell you more about me than you needed to know, right? But I went to Thousand Trails to look at uh, RV parks. And then I happened to like, I don't know, a day later, uh, go looking at the lottery numbers and look what that popped up. I'm on the lottery calculator, right? Cause I'm envisioning what I'm gonna buy with my big winnings, right guys? Cause we, you know, so that probably again is just silly but I, I like to play the lottery and look what pops up. Thousand trails pops up with an ad. So you know what? This is why retargeting is so powerful. You know, I'm, I'm not on another site for, for, you know, looking at RV parks. I'm on a, a lottery calculator site for crying out loud. And it reminds me, oh yeah, thousand trails. Now I know what's happening here, but not everybody does. All right. I mean, I know everyone on this call does, but your visitors may not understand retargeting. And when they start to see things over and over again, either here or in the Facebook feed or wherever they are, that is the frequency of illusion, which makes it good, uh, uh, which makes it really work. OK, reticular activator. All right. That's a new one, DJ. So next time we talk, you're going to explain the reticular activator, which sounds like you're making my eyes open. Is that the concept? I guess maybe. Anyway, third one, anchoring uh, principle. All right. People love to compare. I mean, people compare all sorts of things. Now, here's the thing. You know, they may not want to drive the best car or whatever it is, you know, but, but they will compare what you have versus what I have. Right. And then here's something. As odd as it sounds, somebody who might be reluctant to buy something for a hundred dollars could absolutely be convinced to spend more money, you know, if it's anchored in value. So let me give you an example of this. Now, this is an example that didn't necessarily speak to me, but I try to show different types of examples. So these are e-bikes, all right? And I gotta be honest with you, I'm not buying a bike that's 7,500. The next one's 5,500, 5,250. So this was, they say sorted by bestsellers, Trust me when I say that's not what they're doing here, all right? What's happening here is this is anchored in, in big to small. And we have tested this, I can't tell you how many times. 
that when you anchor from a large number to a low number, and you normally see the reverse on most websites where it's a low number to the bigger number, let me tell you the, the, the psychology behind it. People have a fear of missing out. So if I look at a $7,500 bike versus a $5,500 bike, if I was in the market for one of these, I might ask myself the following question. Well, if I go with the cheaper bike, what am I losing? People hate to give up on that kind of stuff. So that's how I think about it. From the more expensive left to right, what am I giving up? And when you do this right, this anchoring principle, what it does is it increases the average order value and, and increases conversion rate because people don't want to, to, um, to lose out on things. Now, the reverse of, of this, and you see this a lot of times on like when you want to subscribe to like cable in your area or cable and phone and all bundled, you see like the cheap price and then they show you the next thing. Because, you know, add this and add this. Well, do I really want to spend more money? Do I really want to add it? Because here's the thing. People are more motivated by the desire to avoid pain than they are for the need to gain pleasure. And so adding extra features and money that it's going to cost you is saying, here, would you like a little bit extra? Would you like a little bit more? Isn't this nice? Here's a good thing. And so I, you're invoking in me the desire to save money and be cheap versus when you reverse it. And we actually did this on a cable site where we went from the more expensive to less. And then we called out all the things that they would be losing out by having a cheaper package. And it absolutely positively increased the average order value. And that's an example of anchoring. And, and it works you know, nine times out of 10, Nine, you know, 99 times out of 100, there may be an odd site here or there where it doesn't work, but this is the kind of thing you can test and you can test easily and it absolutely tends to work. All right, social proof, all right? Uh, there's powers in numbers. We are basically, well, we're, we're, we're herd creatures, right? And historically being alone, you know, meant death. When we were, when we were in our tribes and we were living, you know, in our, in our, you know, our village or in our cave or wherever we were, you know, to be, you know, abandoned by your tribe meant death. So we are social creatures. We, we actually need to be together. So social media shares and likes and all of those good things, basically what that does is it tells people that, you know what, this is safe to buy. And so that's a persuasion uh, 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 element. Now you'll notice here, this hotel has been booked 14 times in the last 24 hours. That is a lot more um, reasonable to me than Johnny V from Dayton, Ohio, just booked this room. And then another one pops up. I really, while I'm sitting there watching these people are magically booking this room, okay? or magically signing up for whatever this thing is, seriously, I'm not buying it. But this hotel has been booked 14 times in the last 24 hours. Yeah, I'm willing to believe that that might be true, all right? That's an example you know, of social proof. But notice it's also underneath some reviews. Reviews are also social proof. So between the two, that really works. Um, and now reviews and ratings, all right? Not only are you, you giving, uh, you know, look at all the people that like this, but by showing reviews, and we use reviews on all sorts of sites, whether it's a lead gen site, a subscription site, or an e-commerce site, reviews really, really, really make a major difference. You know, and, and it's, you know, it's okay to have reviews that say, I didn't like this, or I didn't like that, right? As long as your reviews on the most part are positive and they're really good, I'm gonna feel pretty good about the reviews for this shoe, right? So you want them to be real. And you know, now if you don't have a lot of reviews or if you don't have any reviews, you could write, be the first to review this new product, right? That's, there's nothing wrong with that. All right, moving on. The principle of benefits. What's in it for me? With them. W I I F M. With them. All right. Uh, what's in it for me? People are driven by self interest. All right. So when you get someone to convert, you have to prove to them that 
what they're going to get is a great personal advantage, you know, help them get the motivation to act on it. So before I go for this slide, we've all heard this. I, know, I assume we've all heard this. Maybe we haven't. But you've heard that, you know, people, um, you know, don't buy the steak because they, they, you know, they want to eat healthy or whatever it is. They buy the steak because of the sizzle. When you go to a steakhouse and the steak is served and it's sizzling, you know, and you've got the, that aroma and, and, and again, not meaning if you've got any vegans in the group, I'm not trying to insult anybody here, but but if you're a steak eater and you get that, you, you your mouth starts to, actually my mouth starts to what I just talking about. That's just silly. But, you know, what happens is you are, you are, you are excited about the sizzle and the smell, all right, as opposed to the anticipation of, you know, it's going to be a good steak, right? So, it's the benefits. What's it doing? What's in it for me? All right. So you want to make sure that your value proposition is clear and you want to make sure that you write benefits for the visitor, not for you. You write the benefits for the visitor. So what's an example of this? All right. So I've used this site in the past as an example, but the point of this is, is, um, uh, and yes, we just got a uh, notice. Yes, welcome to our new visitor. And yes, there will be a recording at the end. So no worries. All right. So this example here, the fastest way to get your DD-214. So a DD-214 is basically one of the discharge documents that you get when you leave the U.S. military. All right. And, and getting it from the government, when you first get it, you get your document. But to get a copy of it later on, oh, my God, it's not easy. All right. And so here's a company that basically says we will get it for you. But look at this. There, if, if this isn't a clear example, the fastest way to get your DD-214. And there's a number of reasons why people need this to get a loan, to get a, you know, like a VA loan, to, uh, to uh, you know, get some VA benefits. There's all sorts of things that they, they, they want these things for. All right. And whenever you want one of these, you want it now. You don't want to wait months to get it. So the benefit, and this is like the main statement right there, the fastest way to get it. There's no confusion about what somebody gets. All right. The principle of authority. All right. When your site's being endorsed by someone uh, well-known uh, in your industry, they will believe you. All right. And here's something else. You can be the expert. You can be the authority. All right. I mean, you all, well, I shouldn't say you all know, but I mean, I've literally written a book on this. This book that I've got, you know, Relationship Marketing in the Digital World, is an, makes me an authority in the eyes of a lot of people. So we can be our own authority in that. So if you, but if you don't have a book, you could have everything from, you know, if you're selling something medical, doctor, uh, so and so, famous heart surgeon. And again, I'm, I'm making it up because I don't know what you're selling, but being, uh, having authority from, you know, some other group of people makes makes it work. So here, uh, Lee Child, uh, Jack Reacher series, um, uh, which I happen to like. So you know, I was looking at the Jack Reacher theory, series here, right? But if you look at it, number one uh, New York Times bestseller, that's authority. That makes me feel really good about this, that it was a New York Times bestseller. All right. Praise for the Jack Reacher book. Now we've got reviews from other magazines. So here's a large display of authority. And you've all seen these, I think, for, for other books. It basically says everybody thinks this is wonderful. That's kind of the concept. So authority makes people feel safe. It's a little like the herd, but it's, it's more than that because these are people of authority. We are trained, and this is almost sad, but we are trained to accept the words of authority. So for example, um, and hopefully you're not doing this folks, but you know, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you've got this, this, and this. And yes, I know you can get a second opinion, but how many of us actually do that? We've been trained that doctors know what they're talking about. And so uh, right or wrong, okay. And so what do we do? We accept what they say. All right. We are trained that when uh, uh, when we are pulled over by uh, uh, a police officer, that what they're telling us, you know, is is the truth that we were speeding or we were this or we were that. 
But did you know that um, that law enforcement is actually allowed to lie to you to get you to 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 um, to, in, you know, basically incriminate yourself? Um, and again, I'm not saying anything negative about law enforcement or or doctors, but but we are trained to accept authority because of who someone is. That principle can be used on your marketing. Principle of scarcity. Um, people are definitely afraid of loss. As a matter of fact, let's let's talk about. I hate to bring this up, but let's talk about the pandemic, right? Somebody said, uh, and I don't know if you remember this. Toilet paper is scarce, and so what did people do? They ran to the supermarkets, right? And they 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 bought every piece of toilet paper they could possibly get, and all the paper plates and all this. Why? Okay, seriously because people are afraid that they won't get theirs, right? And so the principle of scarcity really is a motivator because people are afraid that they won't get whatever it is. So if if you have something where it's a limited time offer and it's truly a limited time offer, then, uh, then that works. Well, what's an example of this? Well, Black Friday is a good example. People are trained right now that Black Friday happens on Black Friday and maybe there's Cyber Monday. But after that, we are trained, whether it's true or not, that those prices are going to go back up and that these are where the special deals come from. Another one is limited quantity remaining or only five left. You've seen those. Again, if I want this thing, I'm going to feel like I need to get it now. Otherwise, I'm out of luck. The principle of exclusivity. I love this one. We use this, you know, I can't even tell you how many times. But if if you've got something that's exclusive, and we use words like curated, right? People love to get things that are curated. So if we look at this example here of exclusivity, you know, 20% off, all right, on Urban Outfitters rewards, members. So you have to be a member to get this, that is in the exclusive category. So I'm not getting it, so I guess I need to be a member. So now they're getting me to convert to a couple of things, right? So exclusivity, uh, you know, uh, curated, members only, whatever it is to get me to take action is absolutely an element, a a persuasion element that gets people to take action. All right, principle of impulse. All right, how many of you have done this? Did you really need to buy that ice cream cone? All right, well, maybe that's not the right example. But did you really need to buy whatever that thing is? So kind of an impulse thing. So what triggers an impulse? What triggers an impulse is something flashy. Um, Impulse buys are something where it catches my attention. And I go, yeah, you know what? That get, I'll buy that. A great example, I can't tell you how much junk I bought. And and so uh, not that I'm a shopaholic, but I'm on my Facebook feed and I see something and I go, oh, that's kind of cool. And the next thing I know, I bought the damn thing, right? And it's like, because it was flashy, it caught my attention. And so that's an example of impulse. You have to basically flash something in front of them to get them to want to take action, all right? And they have to be in the right frame of mind and it has to be, have a little bit of pizzazz and be very persuasive as to, oh, this is something that makes sense to me. The principles of likability. This is our last one, all right? And you've all heard, again, I shouldn't say we've all heard, but people like to do business with people they like and trust. That's why we put trust on a, on a website. But that's also why you know we wanna put likability on it. If you are cold and sterile on your website, people aren't going to you know, like your website. It's got to feel safe. It's got to feel warm. So for example, we were doing a redesign for a client right now who is selling car seats, baby car seats. And so trust me, all the imagery, everything we're doing is, is making people go, ooh, with the baby and ah, with the baby, right? And it's all about likability. We're using the images of the baby to, or the babies to, to, to make people feel 
you know, at home or, or feel like they can trust us. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. And again, just on the baby theme. So every month, because we have our, our employees are literally scattered around the globe now. Um, uh, we have people in everywhere from Japan to Portugal to all over the United States to, you know, um, you know, uh, well, you just name it. I think we're in like eight different countries now. So we have a monthly meeting where everybody gets together and we talk about what's going on in the business. And we then show pictures of what's going on in our lives. It's a way, even though we're remote, that we kind of can stay in touch with each other. And and one of our people showed a picture of his, his new baby. Well, pretty much game over. Not that it was a contest, but, you know, people were showing pictures of like their trip and what they did. And he shows the picture of the baby. He won. Okay. It was just like it was one of those moments. You want to have those moments on your website. So you want to be informal. You want to be helpful. You want to be as relatable as possible. You want to use appropriate images that your your audience can identify with. And you want it to have the right aesthetic. So if you're selling, you know, baby clothes or baby carriages or whatever, it's soft. If you're selling, you know, car parts, it's not, it's, it's more muscle oriented. It's harder. You want to use the right aesthetics to make it relatable for your visitor. All right. So with all of that said, guys, you know, persuasion and marketing, it is an art form. It is a strategy. And it needs to be thought about from the perspective of the visitor. And so it's all about what is their self-interest? How can you be in tune with your visitor so that you can give them the opportunity to buy from you, to sign up for you, to subscribe, giving them the opportunity by being subtly persuasive as opposed to banging them in the head and saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. Persuasion in marketing, if nothing else, is all about being subtle. All right, with all of that said, as always, I wanna thank everybody very much for their time today. Um, you know, if you're interested in our book, uh, you'll get this, uh, this presentation, so I'll have a link to it. If you would like to talk to one of my team members about uh, your website, we're happy to do that. And I invite all of you who haven't already, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. We would love to at least get to know you a little bit virtually. So with all of that, I wanna thank you. Um, oh, hey, Al, good to see you, buddy. And DJ, good to see you too. Um, anyway, I want to thank you all uh, for your time and attention. And if we can be of assistance in any way, shape or form, please let us know. Hope you have a great day. Take care.